So we're going to start with three words. The three words are hegemony, modularity, and displacement. Now, it sounds pretty weird to have three words that you're going to actually uh, try and save the world with. One is a negative word, one is an action, and the third one is a way of revival. First one is hegemony. That's what we have at the moment. The whole world as partly explained by, by my daughter, uh, is about being able to compete and uh, get to a point of superiority. So somebody, we, we, we have humanity that has become superior to nature, but in humanity we have people who wish to be there at the very top. By the way, these guys are called anarchists, right? They're not the anarchists that you think of anarchy, but they are anarchists, they, but they are right-wing anarchists. They're like sort of like super Swiss and they want to be at the very very top of everything and run everything and they are competing against each other uh, in order to be able to take over everything and achieve hegemony. Now we think of hegemony in terms of nations but in fact actually hegemony is about anything that wishes to be in control of everything. The second word is modularity which is the antithesis of hegemony. Modularity means that everything is small, cut into the small bits, and you use it to put together uh, things. But molecular systems are module. Uh, 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 atomic theory is all about modularity, about how things connect to one thing, to the next thing, to the next thing, to the next thing, and actually form and work together, but not necessarily be connected. So there is no, in nature there is no hegemony. There is, there are shifting patterns, uh, but they're all modular shifting patterns. The third is displacement. Displacement is the antithesis of hegemony, because what you want to do is use modularity to displace hegemony. Now I'll explain to you that this in terms of the energy industry. I love the energy industry because it's a perfect example of how to screw everyone. It, it's particularly the electricity industry. The electricity industry is the ultimate of hegemony. So you have, in France, you have the electricity industry run basically by a company called Electricity de France. And in the rest of Europe, you have um, uh, similar sorts of organizations, all of which are vying to become the organization that runs everything. Uh, you've got to, got to think about this, the madness of this. I mean, these people are really off their, off their rockets. But how do they do it? I'm going to make you a little graph here. And this is called my general electric graft, graph. Now, I like general electric because general electric is a very unsophisticated system of screwing everyone. And this is the way it works. Over here you have the electricity that you're going to need in seven years. Over here is where you are now. That's where you're going to be in seven years, but the way in which that operates in terms of the market is like that. It dog legs up to that point. So here, you don't need all that electricity, but around here, you're going to start needing it and it's going to be really difficult to get hold of, and that's seven years. Why is it seven years? Because it takes seven years to build a power station, that, on average. And General, Motors is very, uh, General Electric is very good at building power stations. They're even better at screwing money out of you. And this is the way they do it. You are Mr. Electric. And you say, well, I want all that electricity within seven years. And I want to be in full production by maybe 10 years. Okay, and General Electric comes in and says, oh, okay, we'll build you a, a, a power station, but we need money to do that. 
and we need the money up front in order to get to the to, to that point. But the fact of the matter is, it's probably not going to be constructed until about then. But we want the money in advance. So they take the money there. And the Mr. Electricity says, well, wait a minute, I don't have all that money. And they say, not a problem, not a problem. We will lend you the money to build your power plant. So they have a thing called GE Capital. And GE Capital lends the money to, in order for General Electric to build you your, uh, your uh, power station. Thing is, they're lending you the money there when you're not making any electricity. And they haven't done anything. So they lend you the money there and they're collecting the interest on the cost of that uh, uh, production of that um, power plant. Now, curiously, by the time you get to build that power plant, the interest is actually greater than the loan that you started out with. Now, that is hegemony. That's the way it works. Whatever you do, you're going to have to pay for in advance in such a way that you are in debt all the time. You're constantly in debt. When you've built your power station, the actual revenue you get from the power station will take 20 years before you've actually paid off that debt. So therefore, you're in the uh, general, uh, general Electric is still in control because it's still getting its money back, its principal back. So they're still in control. 20, 30 years. That's pretty good. It's a really great idea. Now, along we come. And we are the modularity people. What do I mean by modularity? What if you turn around and said, I'm going to provide you with power like this. In those increments. What if I can, instead of building a huge system, I'm going to build little tiny systems and gradually build up to the amount of energy that you require? And by the way, we're not going to charge you for that. And the reason we're not going to charge you for that is because that period of time is so short, it's unnecessary. What we're going to do is we're going to set up a system whereby the electricity that you require, the power that you require, is funded by the actual immediate financial requirement as a tariff. In other words, the amount of money you pay for your electricity. And you say, you t tell us that you will pay us for that little tiny bit of electricity and we'll be able to build this thing and it won't cost you anything. It won't cost you interest. There'll be no interest. There'll be nothing like that. As you do this, of course, what happens is all this goes away. You've now undermined general electric finances. And you under, under, uh, you've also undermined their ability to build that massive power plant. And when you do that, you undermine the transmission of power or whatever. Now, you turn around and say, well, nobody's doing this, these power plants anymore. We're, we've got offshore wind farms. Does anybody know who the biggest producer of, of offshore wind farms is? Hands up, anybody who knows. Which is the biggest, biggest producer of wind farms and wind, wind turbines in the world? Guess who? General Electric! <laughs> it's the same guys! And they're very expensive. The capital cost of wind turbines and wind turbine farms is enormous. Even more than the amount of money you would have paid in the old days to get a large generating station. So, modularity allows you to do this, change the financial system, undermine the system, but it does something else. It displaces, and this is where displacement comes in, it displaces all of this system. And that system, this system, represents the world financial system. It represents the way in which we trade. It represents the way in which we exploit things, people, the environment, and 
all the, of those characteristics that make up that, that exploitation. But it does something else as well. And that is, if you do this, and you do it pro properly, what you end up doing is collaborating with others to do exactly that thing, to be able to make these. You have to collaborate. So what we've done is we've developed a technology where the only way you can really do it is by collaborating and doing it in small bits. That modularity is also an economic sense of, of modularity. It's not just the technology, it's also the, uh, uh, the way in which you finance and the way in which you do things and the way in which you uh, en engage people in making these things. So we, and what we have done was we've developed a fuel cell technology that is entirely modular. So you have a fuel cell that big, right? And any one of you can make those fuel cells. I can teach you how to do it. Anyone can do it. You want more, so you build another one. You want more, you build another one. And if you can't build that, you get somebody to help you and you make another one. And you collaborate throughout a whole system of collaboration and we call that Collaborative Manufacturing Enterprise, CME, where we take a group of people and say, okay, you're going to make fuel cells for your area and your community. And that community then becomes engaged in the building of these modular systems. And eventually that community ends up owning that whole thing. How do we know that happens? Well, extraordinarily, in 1922, in the United States, uh, a president, Hoover, who was probably one of the worst presidents they ever had in the United States, who was responsible for the Great Depression. One of the things that he did do that was clever was he started a thing called electricity cooperatives. And he did it for this reason. They couldn't get the big electricity companies to supply electricity to rural areas. And his political base was the rural areas, a bit like Donald Trump, his uh, political base uh, 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 are the, uh, the non-urban people. But in this case, this happened to be a good thing. They started a thing called rural cooperatives. And these were 1,500 people who would get together and they would form a cooperative to buy electricity and get electricity installed. And the, the law made it that they could not be taken over, that they could not be bought and they could not be sold, that all they could do was make electricity. Well, and they could collaborate with each other. So take a state like the state of Georgia, probably one of the most regressive right-wing states in America. But guess what? They have these rural cooperatives and they, they, they are cooperative electricity owners and they're all subscriber based. In other words, if you bought electricity, you were part owner of the cooperative. Now they own all of the electricity production in Georgia. Even the big companies, the grid, they own nuclear power stations. They own all of this stuff and it's all owned by these little tiny cooperatives. So there you get the displacement of big electricity companies like Southern Power, etc. And that's the basis of the technology that we're talking about. That we do that, we, we do the tech, build the technology and make the technology as a community exercise, as a community led collaborative. Now you'll notice I, I don't use the word collective because the moment you do collective, you end up building GE by another name. It's the same thing. But by collaborative, what you're doing is you're giving and taking and making, you're, you're making access to the, the ownership and the value of what you're building, particularly for the community. So now there is a movement in Europe for community energy. It's beginning to happen. There's beginning to be legislation for community energy. The moment that legislation comes into power, the moment that legislation is there, and it's, it's only there if people want it to be and make it, make it happen, that's when you get rid of this. So the technology is, can we make fuel cells? Well, the fuel cell industry says, 
I'm uh, Mr. Fuel Cell Company, and I'm the only one in the world who can actually make this fuel cell. And the, our, our fuel cell is the best fuel cell, it's the best fantastic fuel cell, and we're the only ones. And by the way, we work with companies that can only make the, make the materials, they're the only people who have access to the materials, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what I did, and what my friends did, and we all worked together, was to develop a fuel cell that anybody could make, that had common materials, simple materials, etc. And that's what we do, we make those. And then what we do is we turn around to small groups of people and say, why don't you make these fuel cells for your community and integrate the production of those fuel cells into the community so that the community benefits directly from A, the energy that you produce, B, the ability to move that energy around in effect of the trading of that energy, C, the jobs and the skills that go along with making those fuel cells, Four, the services of those fuel cells, the ability to be able to make other things that go along with those fuel cells, which, um, uh, uh, which will be described a little later. This is all this stuff that I'm not going to describe, but will be described by one of my colleagues, my new colleagues. Uh, so it generates a whole pile of other industries and other things that require collaboration and it's collaboration that doesn't exploit anything. In fact, it does the entire reverse. It provides things that ordinarily are exploitative. Uh, you have energy that is very cheap. At the moment in the, in the UK, for example, energy is about 16 and a half pence per kilowatt hour. In the Caribbean, it's 50 cents per kilowatt hour. The technology we're talking about with all of this is about seven and a half pence per kilowatt hour. Could you imagine what that would do in the Caribbean? Could you imagine the turnaround of the economics of the Caribbean if suddenly, instead of paying 50 cents per kilowatt hour, they were paying seven and a half cents per kilowatt hour? Even in the UK, less than half of the cost the existing cost of electricity. Uh, equally, could you also imagine how irritated the people are who are actually currently benefiting from that, uh, from the high rates? And that is where displacement comes in again, because you're displacing them. You're making it so economically they cannot possibly exist. Now, they might come around and say, we're going to legislate against you. That's what they're going to try and do. That's the only way they, they, can, they can get out of the ability to be able to use this technology to be able to produce low-cost uh, energy and to be able to avoid displacement. There's only one problem with that. It's community-based. You cannot go round to Mr. Jones on Acacia Avenue and say, you can't do this because he's going to just say, bugger off, I'm going to do, do what I want to do. And I'm going to talk to my neighbor and he's going to do it. And no, we don't care. We don't care. We'll riot in the streets. We'll do whatever it is. It's very, very difficult to be able to control the actions of something that is good and useful and that is generally and universally accepted. So, say you're in Africa. You're paying 30 cents per kilowatt hour. Um, you are in a country that is run principally by people from the outside. You know, the GEs, the GEs followers, the politicians who follow GE, the, all, all of that sort of stuff. And the top guy there is uh, a bit dodgy. I mean, I'm taking Africa, and I'm not identifying Africa as necessarily dodgy, it's just that it's easier to do it this way because we in, uh, in Britain have the, probably one of the most dodgy people in the world. I mean, he would make a fantastically good Af African uh, dictator. So, but say we have a, a guy like that and he's saying, well, I get a bit of dough from the existing high rates. And you come in and say, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna give you the ability to be able to undercut those rates. He won't be able to do that anymore. He won't be able to do it because the people will rebel and they'll rebel in the best way they can, which is to be able to make these. You don't have to go to somebody else to make them. You make them yourself. 
is very, very difficult to control. So that's the way you avoid legislation, by being able to implement and apply the technology in such a way that they, they, the hegemony people, can't actually maintain control. So that's what we do. That's the only way I, as an old geezer, can follow the, me the, uh, the, uh, the meanings of Lao Tzu, who, by the way, I studied a lot when I was in, uh, at university. I also studied uh, Li Po's poetry and discovered one thing about Li Po, which you may not know. He want, wrote one of the best pornographic books ever written. Uh, um, and to the extent that if you go to a Chinese restaurant and you, you actually mention the book, that people will actually sit there in great embarrassment and pretend you're not there. So uh, those, this is, the, this is the, the, the way in which I can actually look to Lao Tzu and say, you know what a house is? It's a big block without an interior of a block. And it's that, that logic that pervades even this technology. The fuel cell as, as a technology is, is very old. It, it predates the combustion engine even. Um, and it was used for, for the most difficult technological mission that we had had in the 50s, which is to go to the moon. So, um, so it, it was used because it's so reliable and you can, you can make water from it and you can make electricity from it, and you can do it inside of a tiny space shuttle. So you can use it, I mean, let me put it to you this way. If you put a diesel generator inside of a space shuttle and tried to go to the moon, you would die from the fumes. So that's, and it's also extremely noisy. If you, which they do use nuclear power to, um, to power space shuttles, you, um, well, if they explode, you've got nuclear fallout all over the planet. And, and, and every time they fly missions to the moon using nuclear power to, to, to power the shuttles, they take that risk on behalf of everyone, on behalf of us, and they do it regularly. So this is, um, so this is what I call a moon cell. Like you have a solar cell, you have a moon cell. So I, I've, I've, I call what dad does moon cells because the fuel cell is just a shitty word and it, it should never have been used. So anyway, there you go. A lot of the time people say um, it takes more energy than it can make because we're talking about hydrogen fuel cells. So I'll just go through a few things. And, one, and the first thing that we have to notice with that issue is that, well, you know, if you look at the periodic table, that H is at the number one because it's the most abundant element in the universe. So it begs the question, why is the most abundant element in the universe so hard to get a hold of? Well, you know, we all know the reason. So the other thing is, is that the hydrogen blew up the Hindenburg. If you remember the um, hot air balloon exploded, everybody thinks that that was hydrogen. That was not hydrogen. Um, you just should not paint a balloon in gunpowder and put it up into space where there's electrical currents such as lightning that would set fire to it and thus explode any gas that may be on the inside, which is what they did. So the paint on the Hindenburg was actually made out of gunpowder, essentially the same thing. That's why it exploded. So we can put that to bed as well. And then if it's so great, your technology, then why don't we have it? And it's like, well, dad just explained to you that people make a lot of money doing this kind of stuff. You, you, we, we don't need sophisticated tools. As you can see, my dad is not particularly a sophisticated tool maker. So to do this, and that is why they don't want people to do it because it's not sophisticated and if it's not sophisticated they can't charge shitloads of money for it. So then I, I usually like play this bit where it's dad, you know, um, in... I don't know if it's actually playing when I press this button or not. Oh yeah, there you go. So it's him down in the barn where you've been and he's making... That's one of the ADs that you're making. Um, and do you want to do you wanna maybe talk about that a little, how ADs work? He's going to talk about it. Do you want to talk it. about ADs? I will talk about the gasification process. Okay. okay, all right. So you talk a little bit about right. ADs. Okay, I'll talk, talk about AD. Uh, AD stands for anaerobic digester uh, and the uh, anaerobic digestion. And basically what it is, is it's turning organic material into its component gases. And organic material is all around you. Uh, so, and also you make it, it's called poo. And it's a really wonderful fuel. It's a superb fuel. It's very sophisticated. And not only that, 
but the, you are made of organic material, so when you snuff it, you can be turned into pink froth and used in an anaerobic digester. So you're completely recyclable as energy. It's really good stuff. And the way it works is very simple. You have uh, a big pot full of organic material, poo, leaves, bodies, whatever it is, people you don't like, and you put bugs in it. And these bugs are bacteria, and they eat the uh, organic material. And as they eat the organic material, which is very, very rich, it's like if you eat rich food. What do you do when you eat very rich food? What happens? Anyone? No one's willing to say? That. You fart. fart. <laughs> right. So because your body can't take it. The bugs can't take it. They've got such rich food that they're sitting there and they blow a fart. Okay. That fart is called biogas. <laughs> and biogas is basically CH4. There are other stuff in it. There's sulfur and a whole pile of other nasty bits and pieces that you don't want. But it's basically CH4. CH4 is really good stuff. Uh, CH4 is really good stuff unless you put it into the atmosphere. If you put it into the atmosphere, you'll kill the planet. So you want to be able to use that CH4. By the way, CH4 occurs naturally. If you snuff it and we leave you out in the field long enough, you'll decompose and you'll be creating CH4. So you might as well be made into pink froth. So that's where, that's, that's where we start, the CH4. As we're making that, uh, that biogas, and in this, in this case, it's made, by the way, modular, in a modular manner. Um, as you're making this, you create this CH4. You want to turn that into hydrogen for the fuel cell. So what do you do? Add water. Always good things. You add water. Anything, anything you do in life, it's always better if you add water. So you add water here. So you have CH4, that's a carbon and, uh, uh, and four hydrogen atoms, plus two hydrogen and oxygen, which is the water. And what you want to do is you want to combine that oxygen with that carbon, and you end up with CO2. Oh, holy shit, CO2, that's going to kill us. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. But in fact, actually, if you think about it, it's there already. And it's going to, uh, that's methane, and methane is really nasty stuff. And when methane decomposes, it decomposes into CO2. So it's going to get there anyway. So you are now in a situation which is called CO2 neutral. But it's better than that. Much, much better than that. Because if you can make the CO2, you can uh, retain the CO2. You can, you can store it. Better still, you can use it to put the C, the carbon, back where it belongs, which is into plants. Because what do plants need in order to grow? Anyone? CO2. CO2. <laughs> wow, fantastic. So now you are able to put the carbon back where it belongs and it releases oxygen, which is what we breathe. So you're, you're recycling the same CO2 endlessly. But you're also getting H2 and you're getting the original H4. So you're getting that out of water. And by the way, when you put this into, when you put hydrogen into a fuel cell, does anybody know what the byproduct of uh, a fuel cell is? Anyone? Water! water. <laughs> wow, fantastic. So, so now we're getting the water back that we are, we've actually used in the first place. The magic of electrochemistry, I just love it. Uh, I'm not electrochemist, by the way, and people who are really weird. Anyway, so, so we have this complete uh, chain that is endlessly repeatable. Now, uh, this is one way of getting that gas. There's another way which will be explained to you, with, which is uh, uh, gasification. The interesting thing is if you put these two technologies together, you have a highly efficient system because you're using all of the elements, and that'll be explained to you a little later, all of the elements in order to be able to make a very, very efficient way of removing waste. And by the way, just in case you didn't know, waste is not good stuff. Because nine times out of ten, our friends like Veolia, I want you to remember that name, Veolia, it's a subsidiary of Suez, and Suez is partly French government owned, 
And any government who owns anything is immediately suspicious. You don't want governments owning anything. You want people owning things. In fact, if people own government, it's even better. In fact, if people own government and don't have government, it's even better still. So you have, uh, you have uh, Veolia, and they will come and you will gratefully give them your waste, and they'll put it in a truck, and they'll take it to a thing called an MRA, which is where they take all waste. And then when you're not looking, they'll burn it. <laughs> And they'll say, we're burning it and using the heat to drive turbines, which, by the way, are made by General Electric, just in case you didn't know. Uh, they, 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 will, they will burn it. And guess what they're doing? They're putting CO2 out and it's going straight up into the air. They're not saving it. So this way, you're doing all of those things far more efficiently and you're doing them in your neighborhood. And you own it. The community owns it. So they're not paying for transportation by the way, which is polluting. They're not uh, pay paying for any of those things that these mega corporations rely on. And you're actually being environmentally sound, not just environmentally sound, but you're contributing to the betterment of the environment by doing it. You're improving the environment. So that's the way, th that's the way this works. So I've given you a little bit of chemistry there because I know how much you all love doing chemistry and have been doing chemistry all your life. In fact, actually, probably most of your leisure time is taken up by enjoying doing chemistry. So I've shown you a bit of chemistry, and I've shown you a bit of, of, of uh, biotechnology. The fuel cells, I could actually go through fuel cells, what fu how fuel cells are made and things like that, but it's horrendously boring. But what I can do is say, if you do want to become a CME, I will go all through that and teach you how to do it. And why, do, why am I doing that? Because I love the idea of undermining our friends Gen Electric, Hegenomy, introducing modularity and displacement. Okay? Um, do you want me so, to say anything else? Yeah, no, I just want to carry on from that. So, um, okay. So, have, um, you, have you finished with me then? Um, I don't know. I just wanted to find something here. So, so uh, just, to, just to kind of... Um, I'm just going to do this, hang on. I'm pulling up something else because I wanted to bring up something else. Anyway, so um, just to sort of mention that um, what we have to remember is that when they're fracking, what they're fracking for is methane. And methane is essentially CH4 with some other shit in it, which is what you make in, in that composting toilet. So every time they go off and they say, oh, the fracking here and there and the other, they're making a lot of money literally pulling out four million year old gas that takes you four hours to make in your stomach. So this is, this is also to be known. And the other thing that we need to keep in mind is that methane is far more toxic as a greenhouse gas than CO2 is. When we talk about sequestering and capturing CO2 that we make, um, we're talking about putting that into greenhouses where we can grow algae and other more efficient plants than having fields and fields full of um, corn, nice. which is just going to um, feed animals. And we get a very, percent a very small percentage of the caloric value of the sun that's what we're actually living off cellularly through that process of growing corn, feeding it to an animal and then eating it. So a more efficient way that we'll have to move to, especially as... as um, as we lose control of the environment and plants can't survive without a controlled environment, just like we can't, uh, we, need to, we will need um, concentrated CO2 to be able to produce plants at speed of consumption in dense urban areas um, that are more based on fast growing plants like algae that are also very rich in amino acids, which are the building blocks of proteins that are required for humanity to, to live. Good, good for beings. cosmetics as well. Um, you can use them for a lot of stuff. So, um, so then, so then, essentially, what we're talking about here is 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 a biophilic. What I like to call a biophilic system. But we'll get into that in a minute. 